Classic. Hey everybody, Dr. O here again. All right, we're going to cover metabolism and energy production here in this review. So uh, first point here, the metabolism fact sheet you were given is a critical thing to study. So I've taught for, you know, almost a dozen years now, and I know this is one, you know, cellular respiration, glycolysis, Krebs cycle, et cetera, one of the most difficult things to learn and comprehend. So what I always try to do is I first make sure you're not overwhelmed. I try to tell you, here's exactly what you need to know. And then hopefully you can expand your thinking. If you can maybe see over my shoulder, I have the biochemistry of a cell on a couple posters behind me. It's extremely complex, but um, we have to start somewhere. So the metabolism fact sheet is that foundation. So I basically tell you, here's what goes into every step. Here's what comes out. And here's exactly what you have to know. So if all you can do is create flashcards and quiz yourself and just know those basics and get that foundation laid, I'm okay with that. Because then when you start to incorporate things like the laws of thermodynamics and entropy and these kind of things. Well, at least you have the foundation. So you're no longer, you're no longer using up your mental, your limited mental energy. Um, thinking what, what comes out of the colossus again, you know that so you can hopefully expand your thinking. So I don't dumb things down, but the reason I created this fact sheet is because I want you to have that first step. So I won't go through it all here. You guys know how to read. It's basically bullet pointed and laid down pretty, pretty simple, but, um, um, you know, real big picture, just top of my head, uh, would start with, we start with, well, basically what you're doing is you take high energy compounds and as you turn them, you, you harvest energy from them as you turn them into lower energy compounds. So we'll do, we'll talk about the equation for cellular respiration in just a moment. But you have your fuel inputs, and and you when you're learning this, you always start with glucose. But uh, but fat, there's a process. You know, uh, fat can be you know can be broken down and used as a fuel source. Clearly, or we wouldn't we wouldn't store it. Um, alcohol can be used as a fuel, and then proteins can be used as fuel as well. So. Um, but that so that but big picture you start with glycolysis you take glucose or whatever whatever structure you're going to be burning for fuel and and glycolysis is literally means the tearing apart of glucose so it's a 10 step reaction that splits glucose in half so you start with a 6 carbon glucose with the formula C6H12O6 and you end with two 3 carbon pyruvates so during that process there's what's called a net gain of 2 ATP and the reason we say it that way is because there's actually an energy investment phase where you spend 2 ATP so you go from zero to negative two. So you invest it. It's called, it's called the energy investment phase. Then you have the energy payoff phase where you actually make four ATP. So the reason, so I don't want to confuse you with that. If I ask you how much energy is produced during glycolysis, it's two, but it's a net gain of two ATP. You spend two ATP to make four. Um, so at the end of glycolysis, you've now made a net gain of two ATP and you um, have these two pyruvates, which, which we'll talk about where they go next. Um, but you also have started to create your first um, electron carriers. So you're going to have two NADHs. And the simplest way to look at those is that they're, they're, each one of them is worth three ATP. So I, I think of NADH and its counterpart we'll cover in a moment, FADH2, as casino chips. Because what say, you know, so let's say it's a $3 casino chip, NADH, $3 casino chip, FADH2 would be a $2 um, casino chip. Well, what are they worth? They're worth nothing. If you don't, if you don't cash them in, they're worth nothing. You know, you bring them home, forget them. You're not, you can't spend them at the gas station or paying your bills with them. So they're, they're, they're currency, but not yet. They have to, they have to go to the cashier. So the cashier is the electron transport chain. So, so yes, we've only made two ATP during this, during this glycolysis step, but we now have two of these these chips worth three ATPs a piece. So we're harvesting energy slowly, but we're starting to harvest electrons and hydrogen ions that can be used later. All right, so what happens next depends on the presence or absence of oxygen. It, most of the time we have plenty of oxygen. We're not on the top of Mount Everest. We're not sprinting very often. So me never. But uh, um, So in the presence of oxygen, pyruvate is going to go to what's called the intermediate step where it becomes acetyl-CoA. So acetyl-CoA is the, the keystone of your entire metabolism. So whether it is glucose or fat or alcohol or some proteins, it's your body's going to turn it into acetyl-CoA. Well, acetyl-CoA is going to run through the rest of your metabolism. Your body won't even be able to know where it came from. Did it come from, um, did it come from fat? Did it come from alcohol? Did it come from sugar? Um, there, you, you won't be able to tell. So that's in the presence of oxygen. So we'll come back to that. But in the absence of oxygen, the pyruvate becomes lactate, lactic acid. 
so that's that's where um you build you start to build up lactate and and lactic acid um when you don't have enough oxygen so whether that's um again top of mount everest or while you're exercising so don't think of lactate and lactic acid always as bad things though lactate a, is a really good fuel um the astrocytes in your brain actually take glucose and make lactate your brain cells have a lactate shuttle that can shuttle in um not only um, lactate but also ketones and use them as alternative fuel sources so not, that's not always a problem so there's, uh, I mean, in that situation, exercise related, it's not a problem at all unless you get, you develop, you develop lactic acidosis and that's usually going to be caused by um, sepsis and overgrowth of bacteria that are radically altering, you know, creating hypoxia. So that's a clinical condition that will be covered later. Okay. Um, so presence of oxygen, we went, we went glycolysis where we made two ATP plus those two NADHs. Intermediate step, there's no ATP made, but we do get two more of these um, NADHs. So we get, now we have six more dollars worth of casino chips in our pocket. Now we're at the Krebs cycle. So the Krebs cycle is called a cycle because the first step is connected to the last step. So it just keeps going and going. It's an enzymatic cycle. So during the Krebs cycle, each time you go through it, you're only going to make one ATP. But remember, we split glucose in half, so we're actually going to go through it twice. So during the Krebs cycle, there'll be a net gain of two ATP. Now, if you're looking at your resources, you may see it called GTP, which is then converted, but um, it just will call it two ATP. But then we're going to get six NADHs made during this step, and then two of its $2, you know, two ATP cousins, FADH2, are going to be made here. So you only make two ATP during the Krebs cycle. But it's actually, you're harvesting all sorts of electrons and hydrogen ions that are going to make tons of energy later. So now we're done with the Krebs cycle. We've gone through glycolysis, this intermediate step, and the Krebs cycle. So where are we at? Um, we've only made, you know, we've only made four ATP. We made two a net gain of two ATP during glycolysis, excuse me for no position, um, zero ATP during the intermediate step, and then two during the, the um, Krebs cycle. But we actually, it's less than that because we had to, since we're eukaryotes and have mitochondria, we had to spend, we had to pay, um, you know, $2 to, to get into the mitochondria. So we haven't made a lot of ATP, but we've harvested, harvested a whole bunch of hydrogen ions and electrons, and that's going to be where most of energy comes from. So we've made, we've made four ATP, but had to spend a couple of them, but we now have 10 NADHs. So we now have $30 worth of NADH chips to cash in, and we've made two FADH2, so we, we, which are worth two apiece. So we've made four ATP. But we now have the ability to make 34 more in the next step, the electron transport chain. And that's why if you look at what, what our metabolism is possible when we fully oxidize glucose, we can make 38 ATP. But in human cells, you're going to see 36 because, again, we had to spend two. The bacteria wouldn't. So bacteria that, that use respiration are going to have the same pathways as us, but they don't have a mitochondria. So they're going to, make, they're, they're going to be able to generate 38 ATP. So the electron transport, it's really hard to just to talk about this without showing it to you, but the electron transport chain, you're having electrons are going to flow through this transport system, but that flow of electrons is not what generates energy. The flow of electrons causes a pumping of hydrogen ions. So you've got a boatload of hydrogen ions on the outside of that mitochondrial membrane that don't want to be there. They all have the same charge, so they, they don't like each other, they repel each other, and they're also, they're bumping into each other, so they can't stand being there. So what your mitochondria says is, you don't have to stay out there, you can come in. We pumped you out, but you can come back in. But if you're going to come back in, you have to go through this turnstile, like at a baseball game where everyone walks through one at a time. And that turnstile is ATP synthase. It's the enzyme that as electron, or as these protons flow through it, hydrogen ions or protons, same, same thing. As they flow through it, it causes a rotation. And that spinning is what generates energy. The same way that a wind turbine spinning generates energy or a hydroelectric dam spinning from water generates energy or a nuclear power plant. Most people don't know this, but a nuclear power plant is a steam-driven turbine system with one really dangerous room in it, basically. So that as the steam spins these turbines, it generates energy. So you make energy the same way, like you just got a gazillion um, wind turbines inside you. So as these protons flow through ATP synthase and causes it to spin, that powers the process that turns ADP, adenosine diphosphate, into ATP, adenosine triphosphate. So um, that's the very, very big picture. And I know you're going to need to go through that fact sheet, watch the videos I've created on that as well. 
All right, define metabolism, anabolism, and catabolism. So your metabolism is the sum of all the chemical and physical processes that occur in your body. So how I like to say that is your metabolism is anabolism plus catabolism because anabolism are reactions that require energy and build things. Think like anabolic steroids, making someone bigger. Catabolic reactions break things down and release energy. So you're either breaking things down and releasing energy or building up things and taking energy. But the, the sum of that is your metabolism. So if someone can, you know, if someone has a different metabolism than you're like, when we think metabolism, we think how many donuts can we eat without gaining weight? But um, we do all have different metabolisms and, that, and that's part of the reason why. So, sorry about that. I, rec I record in, the, in my lab, so sometimes people come in, but we're good. Um, so let's, let's do an example. So an example of a catabolic reaction, think about your digestion. You take, you take your food and food has calories. So food has energy, but food also has building blocks in it. So when you digest your food, you're releasing the energy. Let's say you ate a steak. You're releasing the energy, the calories, the energy from that steak, but also you're breaking down the building blocks of that steak into things that you can digest and absorb. So digestion is not only releasing energy, that can be used, but it's also releasing building blocks. Then you absorb those building blocks. Now you have this energy, you have these building blocks. Then you use anabolic reactions to take the amino acids from that, that, um, that steak and build muscle out of it or other proteins, collagen, whatever. Take the fat from that steak and, and build you know, energy or, or other, other things. So the whole you are what you eat, it's because you, you break down your food to get energy and building blocks and then you build up you. So, so your metabolism is the sum of all of that. All right, uh, which organelle is responsible for 95% of ATP production, give or take? That's the mitochondria. It's called the powerhouse of the cell. So the steps we went through, glycolysis is anaerobic. It does not require oxygen, and glycolysis happens in the cytoplasm, just out in the cell guts. So the, two, the net gain of 2 ATP you got during glycolysis, that does not happen in the mitochondria. Then we paid that, we paid that 2 ATPs to shuttle these, these pyruvates into the mitochondria. That's where the rest of ATP is produced. So that's why we say 95% of ATP production. The other 5% is, is what happens during glycolysis. Okay, what is the general equation for cellular respiration? So it's your fuel. So in this case, glucose, C6H12O6, plus oxygen. It's called oxidative phosphorylation. We, this, this relies on oxygen. If we don't have oxygen, Krebs cycle won't work, et cetera. Well, that, that's why we, when we turn pyruvate into lactate instead, lactic acid, sorry. Um, so glucose or C6H12 plus oxygen is going to make ATP plus the waste products, carbon dioxide, and water. So it's hard to think of water as a waste product, but it is in this situation. You produce maybe one and three quarters to two and a quarter cups of water a day metabolically. So that's the equation for cellular respiration. We can certainly use other, um, we can certainly use other fuel sources. We can beta oxidize fat. Um, we can, we can, we can use alternate fuel sources like ketones and stuff as well. But that's the general, when you're first learning cellular respiration, that's the equation. All right, define gluconeogenesis. So here's where, you know, we're not speaking English. It's hard enough to learn these concepts, but you're also learning a new language. We're not, we're speaking Latin and Greek. So gluconeogenesis might sound unbelievable. I, uh, my favorite example, though, is the sternocleidomastoid muscle. It's actually very descriptive. I'll teach you that later. Gluconeogenesis. Genesis means creation. Neo means new. Gluco means glucose. So the name tells you exactly what it is if you understand those rules. That's why I make all these medical terminology resources and I think it's so important. So gluconeogenesis, the creation of new glucose. So it's really the creation of the carbohydrates from non-carbohydrate sources. So your, bo your body can your body can turn protein into sugar. Your body can take the um, the glycerol backbone from fat and basically turn it into glucose. So so if you're not eating glucose, your body has to make it because we do need it. You know, the RDA for carbohydrates is 130 grams a day. I don't know if we need quite that much every day. Like if you're on a ketogenic diet, you certainly aren't eating that much, but your body can make a lot of glucose. So you're, you're, there are cells that require glucose, like red blood cells, parts of your nervous system. They're, they need glucose. So if you don't eat it, your body can make it. There are people that are on carnivore diets that don't eat any carbohydrates um, as close to zero as possible and they're fine. Now, they may not be elite athletes and these kind of things, but your body can make carbs. Uh, your body can make so many cool things. Like if you think about fat, we cover this in nutrition class, but if you think about fats, other than um, your EPA and DHA, or like your, other than your, you know, your, your two essential fatty acids, ALA and LA, um, your body makes them all. Your body can make monounsaturated fats, can make saturated fats, really, really cool. So, 
All right, uh, let's see. Which of the three macronutrients, carbs, lipids, or proteins, are broken down by beta oxidation? I just mentioned that. That's fat. So beta oxidation, let's say you did you did take a, you know, uh, let's say you had a palmitic acid, a fatty acid tail that's 18 carbons long. Beta oxidation is you cut it into two carbon units. Those two carbon units become acetyl-CoA. So just like glucose is split in half, um, six carbon glucose becomes two, three carbon pyruvates. Then when you turn pyruvate into acetyl-CoA, you lop off one of the carbons. Well, that's where this, this lopping off of carbons is where the CO2 we breathe out comes from. So you lop off a carbon and now you have the two, you know, two, two carbon acetyl-CoAs. Well, with this one fatty acid tail of 18 carbons, I can make nine acetyl-CoAs. That's why fat, you can get tons of energy from fat, way more than you can from glucose. The, here's the biggest, here's how I like to compare the two. Glucose is not as good of a fuel source, but it's a quicker fuel source. When you need fuel quickly, glucose will work better. So think about a campfire. The fat would be the big log. It'll burn all night, but it burns real slow. Um, kindling, dry, newspaper, these kind of things, that's glucose. So glucose will not give you as much energy, but it burns quickly. Fat will give you a lot more energy, but burns a lot more slowly. So that's why uh, athletes that are using a lot of fuel will probably do better if they're consuming more carbohydrates. There are low-carb athletes, but let's not get into all that now. All right, um, what are the two electron carriers used in cellular respiration? How many ATPs are each worth? So we've covered both of these already. I'm just gonna make sure I can scroll a little bit here, sorry. I should probably do that before I start these. But uh, So the two electron carriers are NADH and FADH2. Those are our casino chips we talked about. NADH is worth about three ATP, FADH2 is worth about two. So I don't, nothing else to say there really. They, they, they're the ones that deposit the electrons into the electron transport chain. They also give up these extra protons, these hydrogen ions that are needed. So they are a really, really important step. But we've already covered all that. So just one more thing. They're made from B vitamins. When you think of B vitamins, people think of energy vitamins. Well, this is why, or one of the reasons why. Um, NADH is made from the B vitamin niacin. FADH2 is made from the B vitamin riboflavin. So it's kind of an interesting fact. <clears throat> we also need, we need other, uh, you know, we, 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 acetyl-CoA needs B vitamins and stuff. So these aren't the only places where we need B vitamins, but they're interesting ones. All right, what is the net gain of ATP during glycolysis? We already covered that. It's a net gain of two because we spend two to make four. And lastly, in the absence of oxygen, what does pyruvate become? We already said that as well. Pyruvate will become lactic acid if there's not enough oxygen. If there is oxygen, it will become acetyl-CoA. So, all right, that's uh, metabolism and energy production. Get your learn on.